Thank you, Brother Lyle, for leading us in our congregational singing today. Right around Thanksgiving, I started a series that I entitled Attitudes That Crucify, and I'm going to bring that series to a conclusion today as we consider the lesson topic, The Truth About Falsehood. What does the Bible teach concerning lies and falsehood? Whatever the Bible teaches about it will be true because God's Word, the Bible, is truth. Jesus stated, Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. John 17, 17. And so let's consider this afternoon the truth about falsehood. I just want to give you some definitions about falsehood that I think can be helpful. And a lot of times how you define a subject is so very important to your understanding. And so that's a good place to begin. When one speaks of falsehood, he obviously is making an untrue statement. Or anything contrary to truth is false. Falsehood is a lie. Falsehood is something that is fabricated with the intent to deceive. Or falsehood is that which is counterfeit to the truth. Jesus' enemies made false accusations against him, didn't they? They made false accusations against him during his three-year ministry. And likewise, when we consider our Lord as he neared the cross of Calvary, lies were continually told about him. But what does the Bible teach? For just a few minutes this afternoon, I want us to consider various passages that speak on this subject. If indeed Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and we understand that there is no lie in the truth, then we need to take the subject very, very seriously. And so we're going to consider this, uh, this Bible subject of truth as it's contrasted with that which is false. Now, there are a lot of people unfortunately, who do not tell the truth. Have you ever been misled? Has someone ever lied to you? Maybe it was somebody that you trusted and it hurt you deeply. And all of us have to ask ourselves the questions, have, have we ever lied? Have we ever been deceptive? Have we ever misled somebody intentionally? Well, it's a serious subject and with regard to lies, God takes a dim view of it. In Jeremiah 23, 14, we, we read of those prophets of old who were false prophets. Jeremiah said, walked in lies. In 1 John 2, 21, no lie is of the truth. So three basic points we want to consider this afternoon with regard to the truth about falsehood. First, let's consider the parent of falsehood. You know who that is. Jesus identified our enemy on several occasions, and he warned us not to be deceived by that enemy who is also known as the devil or Satan. In John chapter 8, we learn that the devil is a liar. That's not the only place where such is stated. But listen to our Lord Jesus Christ in verse 42 of John 8. He said, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech, even because you cannot hear my word? And then he says, Ye are of your father the devil. And the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in truth, because there's no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar, and the father of it. Now that's some strong language coming from the Lord Jesus Christ, isn't it? When he looked to the religious leaders of his day and he said, I know who you are, and I know your father. You are of your father, the devil. Now, likewise, it is a bold, strong statement to make today, but I'm going to make it. 
because of a responsibility I have to God and His truth. Whoever gives in to lying is doing the works of their father, the devil. God is a God of truth. If we're going to emulate Jesus, that means we want to be a people who love truth and who speak truth and live truth. But falsehood or lies are of the devil. We're first introduced to the devil, of course, in the Garden of Eden. And remember in the Garden of Eden, he came upon the scene doing what? Lying. And he lies about the greatest and biggest subject, that being God. Now God had said to Adam and Eve, in the day that you eat thereof, of the tree in the midst of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. Probably all uh, of the gospel preachers of the past have at some point in time preached a sermon, Knots in the Devil's Tail. And it's interesting when you consider what the devil does with that little word, N-O-T, not. God said, ye will surely die. What did the devil say? Ye shall not surely die. Now, if God inserts the word not, the devil's going to take it away. For example, uh, we understand from the book of James that, uh, that uh, we are not saved by faith alone, but we are saved by our works through an obedient faith. You see then how that by works a man is justified, the text says, and not by faith only, James 2, 24. So the devil will uh, take out the word not when he chooses to do so. He will insert it when he chooses to do so. Whatever it is the opposite that God has said, then that's going to be the position the devil takes. So he says to Adam and Eve, ye shall not surely die. He says, though, regarding works involved in our salvation, that it is by faith only when God says it's not by faith only. Now, who do you believe? Well, we learned very early there in the opening uh, chapters of Genesis to always believe God if you're going to follow who tells the truth. God said, you'll surely die if you eat of that which I have forbidden. And you know, death passed upon all men, Romans 5, 12, because of the transgression in the garden. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the penalty for that sin is death. Now, you get to... Genesis 5, and you read of some who lived almost a millennial, a millennium upon this earth, but then after every one, and he died. So who told the truth? God told the truth. You don't have to go very far if you begin in Genesis chapter 1 to figure out who it is you ought to follow in life, right? If you want to follow the one who's going to tell you the truth, who's going to be honest, you follow God. But those who are of uh, the devil will always speak lies they will tell that which is false. Now, we have to make up our minds who it is we're going to follow. Most people in our world, sadly, are following the one who is the liar. Now, why is he so successful, that being the devil? Well, he's successful because he is a deceiver. Remember, the woman being deceived was in the transgression, 1 Timothy 2.14, Paul says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, Ephesians 6, 14. The devil being a wily, crafty kind of being. He can transform himself into an angel of light, 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. It has always amazed me how many people would rather believe a lie than believe truth, but they do. Paul asked the question, am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth, Galatians 4, 16. Look at Jeremiah chapter 5, and Jeremiah was always speaking to and about these false prophets of old who, uh, would, uh, uh, who would make mockery of the truth of God, who had no problem whatsoever lying and telling that which was false. But in Jeremiah chapter 5, notice in verse 30 where the text reads, A wonderful and horrible thing has uh, happened in the land. A wonderful, or probably a better translation, an amazing uh, and horrible thing is committed in the land. What is it, Jeremiah? The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests bear rule by their means. And God says, My people love to have it so. Or what will you do in the end thereof? Here are those who were hearing lies told to them, and they took delight in those lies. They would rather hear a lie than to hear the truth. Paul would write, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, 
But heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, turn away their ears from the truth and be turned unto fables or unto lies. 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4. And so whenever we consider uh, who is responsible for all of the lies and all the falsehood in our world today, you look no more than to the devil. You'll find who it is. He is responsible for uh, all that is in error, all that is false, all that is a lie. So we understand that. But then what about participating in lies? You see, you and I don't have to engage in lies. We don't have to speak falsehood. We don't have to be dishonest. And yet, it's a common sin and it is a social evil. A lot of people who are in positions of power have no problem lying if that means they can get ahead of somebody else. You know, we have to teach our children constantly, don't lie to me. And the reason that it can be such a difficult subject to impress upon our children is because it's so easy to lie. It seems as if that's the way you get out of some difficulty is just tell a lie. But uh, though it seems easy to lie, when one does, he or she is creating a web of confusion, one that uh, uh, is so uh, uh, pitiful and so uh, uh, difficult, the circumstances surrounding it, that a person will create a, a web of confusion. I mean, the person has to tell one lie uh, to overcome the last lie that he's told. One lie will lead to another lie. And so it may be easy to lie, but it's also a web that, uh, that you're uh, formulating whenever you engage in this kind of deception. Well, what's the attitude of many people toward lying? Put some of these verses down that you might find helpful in your study about lying as it contrasts with telling the truth. Psalm 52, 3, there are those who love lying. They love it. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's indic uh, indicated in this verse that some people don't even know the difference when they are speaking truth or telling a lie. It's just part of who they are. Some take delight in it, Psalm 62, 4. Some seek after deception, Psalm 4, 2. Now there are those who, who love to deceive and there are many who enjoy being deceived. There are those who give heed to lying, Proverbs 7, uh, 17, 14. And this person who does not mind lying will always be ready to engage in gossip. The person who loves to lie does not at all mind engaging in gossip. Now, what should our attitude be? What should our attitude be toward this evil called lying? Well, number one, we're supposed to hate lying. Now, some people don't like to use that word H-A-T-E, but it's a strong word. And never are we to hate people. We understand that. But there are some things that we ought to hate. And lying is one of them. There are some things that, that God hates, he finds uh, abominable. And according to Proverbs 13, 5, a righteous man hates lying. In 1 Corinthians 13, the great love chapter of the Bible, love rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Zephaniah 3, 13 reminds us that we are to avoid lying. Do not engage in that which is false. And do not respect those who tell falsehoods, who tell lies, Psalm 40 and 4, but rather reject them. Reject them because according to Psalm 101, 7, God has rejected them. That's how serious it is for a person to engage in in lying. Psalm 119, 29, pray that ye might be delivered from those who lie. And so when someone says about another person, I would not believe him if he uh, placed his hand on a stack of Bibles. That's a sad commentary on that person's life, isn't it? Uh, when somebody says about another, you never know 
whether that person is telling you the truth or telling you a lie. Isn't that sad? You cannot trust such individuals. There are those who will handle truth as a joke, and there are those who will treat falsehood as if it was sacred truth. They will. Uh, if it's sacred truth, there are some who don't want to hear it. But if it's a lie, there are some who will hold it up as sacred truth. I've heard some people talk about different uh, celebrities and things of that nature, and I've thought for a minute, where would you learn all that information? How do, you, how do you know all of this about these celebrities? And lying on the, the table there in front of me, I find National Enquirer and things of that nature. And some people just love that kind of, of uh, yellow journalism, don't they? Just read a bunch of lies about people and choose to believe that. Some people, some people are a curse to society and they have no standing among decent people. And who am I talking about? Those who engage in lies. Now, people who love God love truth. And they love all truth. They love the truth of the Bible. They love to speak truth with their neighbor. They are individuals who uh, desire truth and speak truth. And so we need to be a people who emulate the Christ who never told a lie. I know that because I know the character of God. And Jesus was God in the flesh, and God does not lie. I never will forget when I was a boy and my dad was quizzing me about uh, what God couldn't do. Oh, I thought God could do everything. I said, what do you mean God can't do something? He said, there's something I can tell you God can't do. The Bible says it. Well, what is it? God cannot lie. He didn't just choose to be a God of truth. That's who he is. That's a descriptive term. Just as he is a God of love, he's a God of truth. And because of that, God who is the one uh, who will judge all mankind, there is a punishment for engaging in falsehood. Proverbs 6, 17 says, The Lord hates a lying tongue. God hates some things, yes. He hates the tongue that will tell a lie. And God will put a stop to it. Psalm 63, 11, The mouth of them that speak lies will be stopped. In fact, in the fifth chapter of Acts, we have a couple named Ananias and Sapphira who would learn how serious it is to lie. Now, it's true that not everybody who lies meets the same fate as did Ananias and Sapphira. But, it's, but here's what happened to Ananias and Sapphira. By telling the lie that they told Peter, the scriptures teach that that was like lying to the Holy Spirit. They were trying to, to deceive the Holy Spirit of God. And Ananias died for such and Sapphira was given an opportunity to correct her mistake, her sin, but she didn't. She lied right along with Ananias, and she died as well. But according to Revelation 21, 8, all liars will find themselves in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. All liars. That's how serious God takes falsehood, and God always teaches us to be like Jesus who always spoke truth. Paul was a truth seeker and a truth speaker. In Ephesians 4.25 he said, Wherefore put away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. Let me ask you this, isn't it only the truth that saves? God will have all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy 2, 4. So whatever God says on any subject, you can mark it down, that's divine truth, isn't it? And therefore, you, you, you can trust in it. You can count on it. You can, you, you, you can uh, put whatever he says into practice and know that's the safe, secure path to take. God's a God of truth, not a God of error. And the devil, our enemy, is a liar, and he's been lying since the very beginning. He lies to people. He always does. He will promise that which he never can deliver. 
And so all the glitter and the glamour that seems so appealing in the world, that's all it is. It's just an appeal to the flesh. And it's so sad because people live their time here on this earth so oftentimes just chasing after what? A lie. And never come to an understanding of God's divine truth. When I extend the Lord's invitation, hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized, what am I doing but stating God's plan of salvation? Therefore, if God said it, it's truth. John 8, 24, except you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. That's a true statement because Jesus said it. Verse 21 of John 8, if you die in your sins, whither I go, you cannot come. He's gone to heaven, but liars don't go to heaven. Luke 13, 3, nay, except you repent, ye shall all likewise perish. That's a true statement because Jesus said it. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. Mark 16, 16. Better believe it because Jesus always speaks truth. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. John 12, 48. What is that which will judge us but God's divine truth? And we can know it. We can understand it. We can put it into practice. We don't have to be confused on the day of judgment wondering what standard, by what standard will we be judged. We will be judged by God's eternal truth. What, is, what did Jesus say? Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. John 17, 17. And then in Matthew uh, uh, chapter uh, 24, 36, uh, heaven and earth shall pass away my, wor my word shall not pass away and so God's word will be standing uh, when Jesus comes again we'll be judged by it long after the stars the moon the sun have grown cold his word will still stand you need to stand on the side of truth and so do I truth is what lasts and God has ordained that all those who speak lies will be punished. There were those who told lies about Jesus that put him on the cross. I don't want to be found guilty of engaging in the same sin that helped crucify my Lord Jesus Christ. I know you don't want that either. And so may I encourage you this afternoon, obey the truth of God. That's always the safe thing to do. Let go of that which is false, Whatever you do, test it by God's standard, His Word, which is His truth. And know this, if we receive with meekness the engrafted Word, our souls will be saved, James 1.25. This afternoon, why not respond positively and favorably to God's divine truth? If that means responding to the invitation, either requesting prayers on your behalf as a child of God or becoming a Christian, in the New Testament way, we urge you to do so, and do so now as together we stand and sing.